audience than when I give talks, I should explain what is Lipschitz geometry. And uh, here I uh, think that it's better to explain what is the singularity theory. Just what is the singularity theory? Generally, the question is if you have, what is non singular point? Uh, let, let's say, let, let me give a simple uh, just a story what it is that if you have a map from R to the N to R to the N, or from C to the N to the C to the N, then you have uh, uh, just an analytic map or algebraic map. Then if you have uh, just uh, the point where the derivative has a maximal rank, then the inverse image is a, is a submanifold, right? So this is the inverse function theorem. So it's, uh, it happens when you have something non-singular, right? So that uh, exactly an interesting object from the singularity theory. And the singularity theory starts uh, if what happens if the, uh, the rank is not maximal. And then if you uh, have something really, uh, and uh, the, question, the main question is what, 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 what happens? If the, uh, what is the inverse image? So this is uh, the main subject. And I will talk really what does it mean and uh, what sort of description of the sets we can have. And uh, then we have just sets, and then we can uh, just subsets of R to the N or subs subsets of C to the N. And then uh, we just have a, uh, we, we analyze them from uh, different viewpoints. And then uh, what is my relation to this conference uh, is that I was a student of Ilya. And uh, there is another relation which is uh, somehow that one of the, my principal collaborator is just somehow a, uh, just has a family relation with the geometric group theory because it's Walter Neumann and uh, who is a son of uh, Bernard Neumann and Hannah Neumann. So, yeah, and also he uh, works in geometric group theory by himself. So that, that there are several relations, but basically there are some other relations that you will see because uh, then we, we uh, but it, it's not exact, uh, exactly the relations. It's a relation in terms of flavor, that there is some flavor in singularity theory that you will see here uh, how this flavor is really related to the uh, geometric group theory. Okay, so this is uh, the introduction. Another thing I just said in the uh, reception that I really also wanted to say in this lecture, but uh, this I will skip. Okay, so then we consider the singular points and uh, really my usual question really will be what happens locally near the singular points. So we have the set, we will consider just complex algebraic sets or uh, let's say uh, sem semi-algebraic sets in R to the M. So and then we consider them from the Lipschitz viewpoint and this is the definition of a Lipschitz map which is basically useless to, gi to, to give here this definition because everybody knows, but believe me, in uh, the audience of algebraic geometry, have to do, have have to do this. So this is the definition. What does it mean? A Lipschitz uh, map and by Lipschitz map, where, where you have a homeomorphism uh, such that uh, the inverse map is also Lipschitz. Okay. And then uh, what is the set up? So who are the metrics? So we have uh, uh, that in our case, X is an algebraic set of C to the N or algebraic or semi-algebraic set of R to the N. Then we have two uh, natural metrics. Then this is the outer metric or Euclidean distance. And then there is also the inner or the length distance. 
something like uh, that given as a infimum, infimum of the length of the uh, just rectifiable arcs connecting to the points, con connecting to points in the set, and the, the arcs who uh, must live in the set itself. So that if you have a single uh, or uh, uh, algebraic or semi-algebraic set, and then if they are connected, then they are arcwise connected also. So then we have arcs, and then we define this inner distance. So now, so we basically be studying uh, this sort of sets, we can study, study these sets with these two metrics uh, with respect uh, to the by Lipschitz equivalence. So this by Lipschitz equivalence is an equivalence relation. So we can make uh, this sort of geometry and uh, usually in singularity theory the people, uh, a part of making the description, they try to make a classification. So then I will tell you really some sort of classifications, a sort of classification that we really have here. And when I will have time, I will just try to explain what is the technique that we live. So then the first definition, uh, who is a normally embedded set? So we take uh, two, these two metrics, the Euclidean, the outer metric, and we have the inner metric, and uh, they are normally embedded if uh, the, uh, let's say, the, if they, uh, they are by Lipschitz equivalent as, uh, as subsets. Then the examples are like this, that if you have a, uh, just a curve, then it is uh, not normally embedded, right? That if you have a, a single curve, then it's not normally embedded because you have uh, two distances. This is the outer distance. And uh, here uh, there is the uh, inner distance. And you can see that uh, outer distance is always much smaller than the inner distance. But if you have, oops, if you have, oops, if you have a horn, which is a revolution surface of a cusp, then it is normally embedded, right? When it is normally embedded. And uh, then uh, the, the things that uh, will come is it it's okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you, you know that uh, you, you, you have a, a cusp-like thing, right? And, uh, but uh, the distance along the surface is just also behaves in the same way as the distance in the surface. It's, it's a real example. You know, I will be mixing quite, uh, quite a few times. I will be mixing complex and real pictures. Okay. Now, let's, uh, uh, I will start from the theorem that uh, had to be, uh, let's say, uh, just basically the main step, the, uh, just the first theorem that, uh, but uh, indeed it is not, because it's, uh, it's proved quite recently. So what is, an, uh, what is Lipschitz regular? So that, uh, well, what is a Lipschitz regular point? So a point in our set is Lipschitz regular if uh, you are just a Lipschitz submanifold. Yeah, uh, just uh, the, our set is a Lipschitz submanifold in a, just nearby. So that everything is local so that we should be a Lipschitz submanifold nearby. So we have a chart which is a by Lipschitz to the image. So let me uh, remind you uh, a theorem of Mumford. And uh, this theorem really was a sort of motivation to uh, some study of uh, just to, to coming back to the study of 
complex algebraic singularities, then uh, if you have a, sub a, a complex algebraic surface in C to the 3, and we have the, a, a single point, and it is topolo if it is topologically regular at x0. So the topologically regular means the same as uh, Lipschitz regular, but if the chart is just a homeomorphism, okay? Then uh, the theorem of Mumford was uh, that uh, topological regularity implies smoothness. So the analog of this is false for curves in the plane, is that Yeah, right? this falls for the curves in the plane. The, the curves for the plane are topologically regular, right? But they are not smooth. They, uh, they uh, just, uh, they are smooth if and only if they are non-singular, right? But uh, for the surfaces, it is the case that uh, for the surfaces, topological uh, regularity and uh, topological regularity and isolated singularity. Because if the singularity is not isolated, then uh, you can just take a, a curve and take and take a product with a, a real line. So then, uh, indeed, here, uh, the, if you have, uh, ju just let me just give you another analogy, another analog with, with the thing that you are thinking about, that y if you have a complex algebraic surface, right, with isolated singularity, then you can intersect your surface with the small sphere around a, a point. So if you intersect the surface with a small sphere, we have a threefold. We have a three manifold. So that if our singularity is isolated, then you have a three manifold, and this three manifold does not depend on the uh, sphere you are taking, right? So th this is called the link of, uh, of the singularity. And indeed, it is a link with the singularity theory with uh, three topology. So that, uh, for instance, then uh, for this sort of uh, singularity as the uh, theorem of existence of GSJ decomposition was proved uh, much uh, before than it was proved now. The now it was proved just quite recently. Yeah, but uh, for this kind of uh, surfaces, uh, for the, this kind of Three folds. Uh, this was proved uh, m much uh, sooner. It was proved by, uh, I, I would say, the proved by Waldhausen, Neumann, and uh, just simultaneously by Hal Waldhausen, Neumann, and Le, Le Dong Trang. And then uh, the, the proof really was just uh, nowadays the proof is extremely trivial. And one day I suppose that. Uh, the, but, but if you take the Perelman manuscript, then he doesn't see any difference between that case and the general case of three poles. But uh, for this case, it, it, may, maybe I can even tell the proof if, we'll, if I will have a time, because, you know, it's just extremely simple uh, today, the, 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 the proof of GSJ decomposition. But motivation of Mumford was like this. So Mumford was young at that time, and his motivation was just to show that this way you will have no contraexample uh, for the Poincaré conjecture. And uh, that if you, uh, he, really he didn't, uh, he considered, uh, his theorem was that if a link is simply connected, then uh, you have a smooth point. So then the link is nothing else as C3, uh, uh, S, uh, S3, right? <coughs> In her, if there is a mom for uh, uh, no, no, that it, it's false. It's false. By plenty of reasons. Uh, that uh, you, 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 for, for instance, if you have, uh, you, you can have, uh, uh, you, you can have breeze current spheres. For instance, if you have this, uh, uh, something like this, uh, x one square plus x2 square, plus x3 square, plus x4 square, uh, equal to y to the, let's say, 
to some k, right? In this case, you will have, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I think nobody sees, right? So you have x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square, uh, I think it's enough, equals to y to certain k. Then here you have a simply connect to think. Uh, the link is just a topological sphere, but it's not smooth. You have just the uh, because of this k, the point is not is is not smooth. So the Mumford theorem false, and we have uh, just is easily false for the higher dimensional singularities. But so this was a motivation, and then here's a Bruch was uh, quite impressed by this uh, theorem of Mumford. And uh, then he had just a sort of series of students who worked on that, uh, who j just started to work on uh, topology of complex surfaces just because of the theorem of Mumford. And Walter Neumann was one of the students of Hirzebruch, and he really started. And then Walthausen was a student of Hirzebruch, then Brinskorn himself was a student of Hirzebruch. And who else? Uh, Gruel, uh, or maybe Gruel was a student of uh, Brinskorn. This, this, uh, but for instance, Waldhausen, Neumann, and Brinskorn was a student of Hirzebruch. And it was a link between uh, algebraic geometry and topology. And uh, then uh, they, this came in two different directions, just in the direction of topology and the direction of uh, algebraic geometry, so that you, you can see the things that are quite in common in these two areas. Okay, then let's, uh, uh, what, what happens in higher dimension when we have uh, uh, the Mumford theorem? So that instead of topologically regular things, uh, uh, we consider just uh, Lipschitz regular. So that uh, just, this is a theorem that if we have uh, Lipschitz regular six, uh, complex algebraic set, no restriction of normality, no restriction on uh, I, a singularity to be isolated, then it is smooth. And, uh, you know, that indeed, uh, by some strange reason, it is a low-cost theorem. What do I mean by low-cost theorem? That you can just, uh, you, you, you can have just not really complicated proof. You shouldn't write big manuscripts just to have a proof of this. So that uh, this theorem is quite recent, it's of this year. But it should be, uh, I think that uh, we had to, uh, show it uh, just something like uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Because uh, then, and the technique is really related to the, uh, to what uh, you are used to use, that the asymptotic cones, and just uh, about another analogy, that uh, your asymptotic cones are just uh, morally nobody else as the uh, good old tangent cones of, uh, let's say, of, of complex algebraic uh, sets. So then uh, the just, uh, this is, and uh, uh, indeed uh, they defined, prob uh, just officially defined by Whitney, but probably that they were known even in the uh, early 1800 and something, when the people really started to work on algebraic geometry. I will, I will come to the proof of this uh, thing just in the uh, end of the talk, if I will have a time. So then this is uh, the result. And uh, now let's see what's happening with complex uh, curves. OK, so then uh, for the complex curves, there is this theorem that first it's unpublished result of Frederick Fahm and Bernard Pissier, and then later uh, just uh, written and published by Alexandre Fernandez. 
And the point is uh, that if you have um, uh, that this theorem is a, a, an extremely interesting theorem and extremely sad. What do, what do, what, what do I mean uh, about a sad theorem? Uh, a sad theorem means that uh, just it, uh, morally it shows that there is no Lipschitz geometry. There is no Lipschitz geometry of the complex algebraic curves. So the Lipschitz geometry is just nothing else as the topology. So that uh, even if we consider our curves, the germs of the curves, as uh, uh, just uh, abstract metric spaces, then the uh, Lipschitz invariants are just nobody else as the uh, topology uh, to, to, uh, as uh, the topology of the embeddings because that if you have an embedding of a complex algebraic curve it it has a, a node a plane curve right then we have a node in uh, s in s3 right we we have a curve right we have a curve in c2 and then we have uh, an intersection with the sphere, right? And in the sphere, we have just a curve in a sphere, which is a node. And the topology of this node is uh, quite well known because it's nothing else as the uh, iterated torus node. And this, uh, I, uh, the structure of this iterated torus node just is given by the Puiseaux expansion of the uh, of our curve okay so then uh, the, the 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 theorem of uh, farm is just uh, saying that there is no Lipschitz geometry and it was said because uh, then because of this result there were no investigation there were no further investigation in this direction uh, up to uh, relatively recently, so that uh, something like 15 years ago, the investigation really resumed because of the following. Because we, uh, a part of the curves, we have surfaces, right? A part of the curves, we have surfaces. And then there is the first example of Branson Spader and uh, why uh, w what really happens with this example that uh, this is uh, as people in singularity theory say it's a mu constant family and there is the uh, Lehrer-Manujan theorem saying the following that if you have a mu constant family of uh, complex algebraic sets, then if uh, mu is a Milner number, whatever, I won't uh, define what it is, and then if it is, uh, it is mu constant, then it is topologically trivial. So then the embedded topology, so the T here is the parameter of the family, and uh, uh, just uh, going with the T, we have the triviality, right? The, the, all the sets of this family have the same topology, uh, embedded topology. But they are not equal, uh, they are not equivalent to each other as, uh, the, 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 okay, that there is an exceptional T, which is T equal to uh, zero, right? I, I, I made a mistake. The T equals to zero, right? Uh, then even with respect to the inner metric, uh, when T is not equal to zero, then they are uh, not by Lipschitz equivalent to the case when T equals to zero. And the reason is uh, another story that I really wanted to tell is the reason is the existence of so-called uh, separating subsets. 
was this. So first of all, what is the density of a set in a point? So we uh, take may, may, mainly all the time I have the same picture. So that I have a set and I have a point, right? And then I take a neighborhood, just a, a sphere, and then I intersect uh, my uh, set with the, uh, with, the, the, with the ball, okay? With the ball, and I take the volume or a Hausdorff measure. Then what's happening, I uh, just, when R turns to zero, I take, uh, just I divide the volume of this ball by the volume of the Euclidean ball. And it always has a limit. It always has a limit. And so that it, it is a nice thing of the, uh, let's say, of the algebraic geometry. Nice thing that, uh, in your case, when you consider groups, uh, whatever, some metric spaces, then the, you, you never have the unique asymptotic cone, right? You can have uh, plenty of, uh, plenty of asymptotic cones. But uh, here, that if you uh, deal with the tangent cone, then the tangent cone is unique. So that it, it, it's defined and unique. So that it's morally, it's a consequence of, let's say, of minimality, of uh, definability of the, uh, of everything that we have in real and complex algebraic geometry. They are all, uh, every body are uh, just definable. And then the definition, uh, just that then you can make a definition of a tangent cone. Just to, to write is the definition of a tangent cone is a biological formula. So that if you write it as a logical formula, then you have that, that it exists and unique. It doesn't depend on the, on the, uh, of a sequence of ultra filter, nothing. Just definitely unique. Sure, uh, because uh, a real algebraic, uh, all the complex algebraic sets are uh, real semi-algebraic subsets. And uh, all uh, complex analytic subsets are sub-analytic sets. So there is no problem with uh, or minimality. And uh, uh, sure, that if we define a tangent cone, then just uh, following Whitney, we have that it's uh, also complex algebraic. And this doesn't follow from O minimality, right? But uh, uh, indeed, there is another, there is a Whitney definition of the tangent cone. So then, the, the, uh, then we have the density function. And uh, then uh, we have the result of Drapier. The density is nothing else as multiplicity. So what is multiplicity of a complex algebraic set is the following, that if you have a complex algebraic set, right, and then you project it somewhere to, to a plane of the same dimension, then we have the, uh, the, then the projection is a finite map almost everywhere. Then you have the number of the, uh, everywhere, but in the generic uh, point, in the generic projection, you have the uh, same number of the parameters. And uh, for the complex algebraic sets, density, equal, uh, density is equal to multiplicity. And this is not so for semi-algebraic or uh, sub-analytic sets. And the, in the next slide, I just mix the real algebraic and uh, complex algebraic setting. So that, what is a separating subset? So we have, a, suppose, we, I, I just define in the, in the sense that you have a semi-algebraic set. That uh, just, uh, I will, I can tell you basically what uh, means the O minimality for, the, for all the setting, uh, definability and everything that, uh, f f first of all, what is, 
a semi-algebraic set. A sem just if you uh, have a set which is defined not by an equation, but by the equation and inequalities. But if you have, if you use just equations, what do you have? Uh, the image of a set defined by equations, by uh, an algebraic map, is not necessary algebraic. Just take a circle and project it. And then uh, it's a segment. A projection of a, uh, uh, of a circle is a segment. But it's semi-algebraic. Then we have a Tarski theorem. Tarski theorem means that if you have a semi-algebraic set and the image of uh, uh, semi-algebraic set by any algebraic or semi-algebraic map, then the, the, the image is also semi-algebraic. And this was just the first, it was the, the, just the beginning of O minimality. Then uh, just, uh, it was the, the, the first example of an o minimal structure that exists. Then we have uh, so-called sub-analytic sets. Sub because uh, if you consider semi-analytic sets, uh, somebody who are defined by analytic equations and inequality, then this fails. Then uh, you, you can have a semi-analytic set uh, whose image is not semi-analytic. Uh, it's an example of Osgood. And then, but if you consider just the sets who are images of uh, uh, semi-analytic sets by proper projections, they, uh, they are called sub-analytic sets. And all semi-analytic sets are sub-analytic. And, uh, and then there are slightly more, uh, let's say, uh, slightly more sub-analytic sets than uh, just uh, semi-analytic. For instance, the example of Osgood gives you the semi-analytic sets. Okay, then uh, here we consider something that can be complex algebraic, and we consider a semi-algebraic subset. A semi-algebraic subset. It's a, a, a thing that, uh, for instance, Itai was talking about the, the sort of Chigger constant. It's a Chigger constant in the sort of non-Archimedean uh, thing that you have what? You have two, uh, that you, you have uh, just complex algebraic set, and that you have a semi-algebraic subset of co-dimension one, dividing uh, my set into two pieces, such that the uh, two pieces, these two pieces, all, uh, both of them are thick. What does it mean thick? It, 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 they have a non-zero density. And uh, non-zero four-dimensional density. And then we have a subset, uh, which is a core dimension one, and it has uh, zero density. So the, uh, I didn't. Oh, I didn't write. So that uh, the density of dimension k minus one y x zero is zero. So that uh, the extremely thin set divides our subsets subset into. Uh, Two pieces. And this is this one is uh, thin, and these two pieces are thick. They have uh, non-zero density. And uh, indeed, in this case, uh, I will talk, uh, talk later. It gives the uh, another example of the uh, thin-thick decomposition that you uh, probably familiar from the hyperbolic geometry, but it's uh, also sort of uh, thin thick decomposition that uh, exists in this setting. For uh, and uh, there is no relation indeed from the Margulis thin thick decomposition and this one. Okay, then uh, what about what's, uh, what's happening that uh, if you have a bi Lipschitz map between two uh, subsets, and the first one has a separating set. 
then the second one also must have a separating set. And le let's come back to the Brianson Spader family. And in the Brianson Spader family, uh, if you have t, t equals zero, we don't have a separating set, right? In uh, if we have, uh, but uh, the, the equation uh, looks quite complicated. But I will, uh, I can give you even more uh, less complicated example where we have a separating set. Just the example, even by the Kleinian surfaces, something like x squared plus y squared equal to z to the k, where k, uh, k plus 1 in the Kleinian notations. Uh, here you have exactly an example where you have a separating set. So that wha wha what when one can uh, say about this sort of simple surface that uh, just, but even in this uh, simple example we have a separating set where you have this sort of Kleinian singularity called AK, just, uh, just the first theory of the uh, simple singularities uh, defined by Felix Klein. And even in this case, we have uh, this sort of uh, story. We have a separating subset. But uh, the point is that here you have the separating subsets uh, the, and uh, the, 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 there is a sort of reason that we have a separating subset in this branson spader family. Okay, then okay, and uh, then some exa uh, th this is the example where we have a separating set. Uh, then uh, you have. Uh, then I was talking about the Kleinian singularity. And then uh, the branson spader family, uh, we, it has no, sep no separating set when t equals to zero. And for other uh, t, it has a separating set. So the existence of a separating set is a bi invariant? Yeah, the existence of the separating set is bi Lipschitz invariant. Yeah, that uh, this is in the previous slide. If you have a, a yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the existence of the separating set is by Lipschitz invariant, right? So let me just uh, another story is uh, about metrically conical singularities. That uh, there is a topological conical structure that I was uh, already talking about, just due to, uh, probably it was also known quite long ago, that, uh, but uh, a lot of people just uh, refer to Milner or to Loyashevich, but I, 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 I'm pretty sure that it was known even before the Milner and Loyashevich. The, the situation is like this, that if you have any definable set, in any or minimal structure, in particular uh, uh, algebraic or semi-algebraic or sub-analytic, uh, 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 semi-analytic, sub-analytic uh, or whatever, or complex algebraic as a uh, special case of uh, semi-algebraic, then if you have any point, then you have a link, an intersection with a small sphere, then the intersection with the small ball is uh, topologically uh, is just homeomorphic to the cone over the intersection with the small sphere. Okay, so that it, it, it means topologically conical structure. So that we have the, the, the x intersect b zero epsilon is homeomorphic to the cone over x intersect S0 epsilon. Okay, this is the topologically omeo. And uh, in the case of the complex curves, it just uh, easily follows from the farm here, 
because uh, that the Lipschitz geometry of a complex curve is just nothing else as the Lipschitz geometry of uh, just a plane or, or the C of the complex line, inner Lipschitz geometry. So then, uh, then uh, so that we are topologically co uh, conical even with respect to the outer metric. Then uh, the examples that I was talking about, then the examples bring you the cases, even this Kleinian singularity, are not metrically conical even with respect to the inner metric. So if we consider the inner metric, we are not metrically conical. Um, but this one, for instance, is. And uh, this says uh, that this one is metrically conical with respect to the inner metric. But there, there are some other properties of uh, this uh, sort of surface. It's also uh, sort of uh, in such a, a sort of simple singularity with respect to the, uh, the classical lists. But they have some uh, other interesting metric properties. So then uh, what happens that uh, he, here I come back to uh, normally uh, the property of being normally embedded just and uh, will refer to uh, will, will just one uh, just here in one single moment I will talk about semi algebraic business. Indeed, I'm a real algebraic geometer rather than complex. So that, uh, in, indeed, uh, this, is, uh, this is a theorem about uh, semi-algebraic sets. So you have x in R to the n be a semi-algebraic set, and I can uh, that easily, there are plenty of examples. Well, I'm, sure, I'm, so, I'm sorry for uh, making the same picture all the time, but uh, suppose that it's a real surface. Then you have two metrics, which is one it is the inner metric, and another one it's the outer. And uh, by the way, the in uh, and uh, you, you can imagine that uh, if this thing will be much closer one to another, so that you will have uh, two arcs, which will be tangent with a big tangency. Then the outer metric uh, knows nothing about. Oh, sorry, no, the outer metric knows about this, but the inner, uh, the inner metric knows nothing about what happens. So then, uh, this is not normally embedded. But anyway, we have the, oops, we have the normally embedded theorem that if you have any semi-algebraic set, then uh, there is another semi-algebraic set that is uh, x tilde, such that uh, this new one, x tilde, is normally embedded in R to the n. And moreover, this x tilde is by Lipschitz equivalent to uh, x with respect to the inner metric. So it always exists. It always exists, and uh, it's not really difficult to, 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 to prove it. If you have, it's something like, just, you can cut into uh, normally embedded subsets, like you can make a, a polygon and cut into convex polygon, a polytope could cut it into con convex polytopes. And then you can um, just m making this, uh, having these sub polytopes, you can make uh, the normal embedding. So that in the definable or real algebraic world, uh, we have the normal embedding theorem. And then the question was, uh, indeed it was, was asked by Tadeusz Mostowski, and uh, the question was that if there is a, a complex algebraic normally embed, no, normal embedding, means that if you have a complex algebraic set, then it's a real semi-algebraic set, right? Then, but uh, so it can be normally embedded as uh, another uh, semi-algebraic set. 
The question is whether it can be normally embedded as a complex algebraic set. And the answer is no. So this is an example. And, uh, also the, in the list of uh, simple singularities, we have the uh, we have an example of uh, someone who does not admit any complex normal embedding. Okay, uh, then uh, I'm just uh, I will switch to uh, some proofs and just uh, to uh, and this will be the uh, basically uh, the same the uh, main figure of the proofs, the main figure of the proofs is a tangent cone. So that, uh, and I just remind you, then uh, the uh, tangent cone, uh, but I, I wrote this, I, I just make the, made, made this definition, and uh, uh, this is uh, just a Hausdorff limit of the uh, sections, normalized sections, by a small sphere, right? And, uh, there is a metric tangent cone uh, defined by Bernick and Litchak. The metric tangent cone, it's just, uh, 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 there are several definitions uh, more generalized than the uh, definition of the tangent cone. You know, that, uh, the, the, indeed there are plenty of definitions. There are algebraic definitions, just extremely algebraic, extremely metric, and whatever. But uh, in the case of real algebraic or semi-algebraic set, all these definitions give the same. Uh, in the complex case, you just take the initial ideal of the ideal defining your complex algebraic set. That if you, and you take the variety corresponding to the initial ideal. And then you have the tangent. There, there are plenty of definitions. But, uh, then uh, this will, be, but if you have a normally embedded thing, uh, so, so you have something which is not normally embedded. We can make a, uh, we can make an embedding of, uh, you can make a normal embedding of X and take its uh, tangent cone. Well, in the other way around, we can make a, just a family of links. We can make a family of links and take the consider the links, so the intersections with the small spheres, and take the uh, Grom of Hausdorff limit, and we, the, this will this will define the metric tangent cone. Okay. Now let me just come back to oh. It's funny that the picture is very similar than the picture of the singularity theory. Okay. Right. So then, uh, some things about the proofs. Some things about the proofs. And maybe some remark on the uh, thin thick decomposition, if I will have a time I have. Something, 10 minutes, right? So let me just uh, indeed, in terms of the metric tangent cone, the Bernick and Lich chuck. It defines something like differential calculus. So that if you have two sets, x, x0, and then you have a set y, y0, and then you have a f from here to here, f will be let's say, definable in the same structure, or let's say, they are semi-algebraic sets. And here will be F, a semi-algebraic semi map. 
So then one can consider a derivative. which will be a map df uh, from t0 x. Oh, all the singular points will be 0. t0 x, I will just define, uh, I, I just uh, use as the tangent space, right? To t0 y, uh, just, uh, and it is the same derivative as the derivative for the, uh, for the for the uh, smooth maps, so you have uh, just a map between manifolds, a smooth map, and we derivate it. So how, how do you do? You take our x. So you have a tangent cone. We have a direction in the tangent cone. We take an arc uh, with this direction. You map an arc by uh, another arc. So there you have f of gamma, Let, suppose uh, it's better that I say, suppose that f is Lipschitz map, it's better. So that we, de we derivate Lipschitz maps. So then we m map uh, f of gamma and then we take the, uh, the tangent vector. So that df of v is the tangent vector to f of gamma. So then, the, 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 this way we have a derivative. This way we define the derivative, which, is, uh, which map, uh, uh, maps uh, the tangent cone to the tangent cone. And then uh, Bernick and Lichak proves that if f is by Lipschitz map, then df is also by Lipschitz. Now, suppose our, uh, I'm going to prove the Lipschitz regularity, just to show that Lipschitz regularity implies smoothness. So this is a theorem of myself, let's say, uh, l let me uh, write that in this way. Fernandes and then Edson Sampai, who is a student. So why I wrote this? Because that if you read it in Portuguese, you will have the word bluff in English. Okay, so that if you just you you put the collaborators this way, you should have sort of. Okay, so this is how how do you have this? So you have our x who is uh, Lipschitz regular. Then we have a chart, phi from C to uh, the K to X by Lipschitz chart. Then uh, these maps uh, the, 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 this maps uh, a small ball in C to the K to some ball uh, in our X, right? Uh, to ball in our X. By Lipschitz. So what do we get here? We have that if you take a derivative, the derivative is also by Lipschitz map. So the by Lipschitz, it, it, it by Lipschitz, so it, it means that the tangent cone uh, is also by Lipschitz Lipschitz regular. Then we come back to the Mumford time to the Mumford's time that, uh, I mean, our time is also Mumford's time, but uh, to that time when he was thinking about this sort of story. And then there was a mathematician uh, called David Priel, 
who was uh, a student in uh, Princeton. He was a student of Gunning. And then in his thesis, he proved that if you have a cone, which is uh, just complex cone, algebraic complex cone, complex cone, who is topologically regular. Indeed, he wanted to just to follow the Mumford result. Then it is smooth. Then it is a plane, because it's a tangent cone, OK? A tangent cone to itself. So then uh, here, it, it means that we have that the tangent cone of our set of Lipschitz regular is nobody else as a plane. Then we can project, then we can project our we can project it's nice that if our tangent cone is a set then we have an orthogonal projection. So we can project P our x to its T0 x to the tangent cone, which is in fact a plane, just C2, C, C to the k. Then if we are not smooth, but uh, don't forget that uh, it means that if we are a Lipschitz regular, in particular, x is normally embedded. Then if we project, if we project our x to the plane, and if the multiplicity is different than 1, if the multiplicity is different than 1, the, you can find two arcs in x in our set that will have the same image by the arc selection lemma. Two real arcs which will we have. Uh, but uh, who is the projection? Who is the... Uh, who is our, uh, it, it's it just, it's a holomorphic map, and holomorphic map is nobody else as a ramified cover. And if you have a ramified cover, then there is a, a ramification locus. So we take our, uh, we, we take a line, who is far, from the ramification locus, from the image, from the discriminant set. That is the image of the ramification locus. So that when we have, we can find two arcs in X, we will have the same image by this projection. But they are tangent. They are tangent. They, but they cannot be tangent because our X is normally embedded. That's it. So that is, that it means that this sort of Mumford analog, uh, or the, theor the analog of Mumford theorem is somehow a low cost theorem. And it could be even easily found in that time. Oh, so I should stop. Thank you. And a happy birthday to Ilya. Different spaces, yes. No, uh, for, for instance, uh, as is in, in the Whitney embedding theorem, one can estimate the uh, embedding dimension. Uh, for in, it will be 2k, and the same, you, you can use the same argument as in the Whitney theorem. Not at all, unfortunately, if it would be canonical. So that, that, that there is a sort of uh, 
uh, you, you know, that uh, as we uh, were saying about the convexity, we can subdivide into normally embedded pieces. It's, it's so called pancake decomposition, just uh, established by Krzysztof Kordika and Adam Poroshinsky. So the, we, and it's extremely non unique. It's just, there are plenty of uh, these sort of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, that <laughs> when there is the next talk. <laughs> so that uh, indeed we can classify uh, all the complex uh, surfaces with isolated singularities with respect to the inner metric. And how do we have it? Uh, indeed, the GSG de uh, for, for the topology, GSG decomposition gives you everything. Uh, that w when I was talking about the Branson Spader example, they have the, the same, they just, they're simple, they're ziphered. But uh, then we don't, uh, so, so the, uh, 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 but uh, if you want to, to have a Lipschitz invariant, the, Lips the complete Lipschitz invariant, is something that it's not some GSG decomposition of the link, non-canonical GSG decomposition with some width. Width is a sort of rates how the loops who live in the Zephyr species, in the Zephyr parts, how do they go to the zero? Uh, the, 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 the rates how do the, the loops approach to zero? But uh, 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 you want me to prove the GSG decomposition for the links? This was uh, the question. <laughs> Not now, okay. Okay, so thanks again, and the next talk to the club. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, only the fiber. Yeah, it's a graph manifold. It's a good one.